So what do you know, while we're waiting on the slides to come up, what do you know about the origins of the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament? Where did it come from? Well, we believe it came from God, of course. But did he lower it down to earth on some kind of a string? Well, we have it in written form. How did we get that written form, those ancient documents? Where did our Bible come from? The material origins of both Testaments, that is, the physical written Bible. Mark has explained to us the spiritual origins of the two Testaments. First, we read the scripture, prophecy of scripture came about as prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. We haven't come to the written part yet. And this is why we believe that all scripture, that is the Bible, is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. If you spend any time on the internet or you've been through any kind of a government school, you know there are other explanations for the origin of the Bible. And one of the most popular is a novel titled The Da Vinci Code, in which one of the fictive characters makes this exclamation, aha, T being burst in with enthusiasm, the fundamental irony of Christianity the Bible as we know it today was collated, but is put together, by the pagan Roman Emperor Constantine the Great. Have you run into that kind of talk before? There's a popular belief out there that the Bible is just simply stuff that men wrote down, and we're stuck with it, and that the Emperor Constantine pulled it all together and imposed it upon the Roman Empire. That is bogus. It, that never happened. We actually have transcripts from the early church councils on what the emperor actually said. And he did not give us our Bible. For this morning, I have certain learning objectives for us. First, I'd like to trace three streams of the First Testament origins, and then to affirm the reliability of the First Testament texts as we have them then to trace three streams of the New Testament origins and likewise affirm their reliability in brief, the Hebrew Bible plus the Greek New Testament translated becomes our modern Bible. Well, on a time scale, we're talking about a period of, down to our date, about 4,000 years of biblical history. This starts with cultural knowledge. By that I mean in the ancient Middle East, there was widespread knowledge about God, the gods, the heavens, the origins of everything in mythical form. And the Bible was largely written as a polemic, that is, an argument against mythology and the supremacy of Yahweh, the God of the Bible. Then another stage of this was community memory. As prophets spoke, as events took place, primarily in Hebrew history, the people remembered it. Now, when Jennifer and I moved to an African country some years ago, we encountered the phenomenon of the griot. These were poets and songwriters who had memorized the lists of all of the chiefs and the kings of their tribe and their country for centuries going back. They memorized it because it was important to them. But then, of course, we know that there were prophetic utterances and messages by those who were understood to be moved by the Spirit of God. And those, too, were remembered and eventually written down. When we come into our common era, we have the phenomenon of Messiah Yeshua, or Jesus Christ. And at the same time, his apostles, who were eyewitnesses and earwitnesses to all that Jesus did and said during his 33 years. And they wrote it down. And then we come to the translations of these written memories that give us the Bibles that we have today. 
The Hebrew Bible, which we call Tanakh, or Older First Testament, Tanakh stands for Torah, Navi'im, and the Kethuvim, the law, the writings, and the prophets. And its growth during more, or within about a thousand years. This is a Bible that developed over time. It was not one man or a team that sat down and made it up and wrote it down to fool us. The language was in Hebrew mainly, but with some Aramaic portions. Those languages are very similar, like Spanish and Portuguese. But the message of the Bible is that the great deity, the creator and ruler of all creation, is Yahweh, or translated in our Bibles, the Lord in capital letters. The main message of which was that Messiah, a great king sent by God, will one day rule peacefully over the whole world. The whole world, including Jew and Gentile. So, the three streams of growth then are the prophetic messages from those who were remembered, then the community memory, the entire nation memorizing their history, their genealogies, and their main events, and cultural knowledge, the mythologies from the surrounding and the languages used in which our Bible is written. All right, let's look at the prophetic messages for just a moment, which came to us in both oral and written form from before the 12th century BC. So we have many phrases in the Bible such as, thus saith the Lord, meaning these are messages believed to have been revealed from God. And we still believe that. And then we have, for example, in Scripture, the Lord spoke to Moses, Moses spoke to Aaron and to his sons and to all the sons of Israel, descendants of Israel. So there was verbal communication going on society-wide. Later we read, Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. Now, if you go back 150 years ago, university professors were completely convinced that the Hebrews could not have written the Bible because writing had not been invented. Well, now we know that writing was invented more than, at least by 3000 BC, and every society in the Middle East had a writing system, including the Hebrews. I took a course once on how to read cuneiform, one of the earliest forms of writing. And then we have the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, transcribed many of the Proverbs and poetical portions of the Bible. They listened to it and they wrote it down. Now, community memory, also in oral and written form. Again, from before the 12th century. So we have in the term Exodus, the instruction, remember this day. Don't forget it. Memorize it. Teach it to your children. And then, according to their genealogies, hey, the Hebrews memorized those genealogies and eventually wrote them for us. And other places, the records are ancient. That is, the Bible editors or writers themselves knew that their sources came from many centuries earlier. And then, tell your children of it. So this became a part of Hebrew culture. The memory was communicated generation by generation. But then there was the wider culture that gave some of the information, at the very least, the li linguistic forms in which we received the Bible from second millennium and earlier. We have phrases like this in the Bible. You broke the heads of the sea monsters on the waters. Sea monsters? You broke their heads? What's that talking about? Well, some would say, well, that's obviously mythology. In fact, it is. It is pagan mythology brought into the Bible to show that Yahweh is the victor over evil and over chaos, not your pagan gods. And of old, the men of renown, we read about in Genesis chapter 6. Well, who were they? Well, they were largely remembered uh, culturally and in a lot of early Jewish literature from before the New Testament, they are described and named, many of them. And we're told what they remembered, they did. The Bible itself mentions new gods that had come recently. Well, what new gods were those? 
Well, those were gods being brought in to Israel from the surrounding nations, which deceived many of the people of God. And they are dealt with in the Bible. And then a phrase like, God has taken his place in the divine council. What? What's that? A divine council? An assembly up in the clouds where God meets with other gods? Well, it's in the Bible. And it, again, this is speech and figures from the wider culture. Now, somewhere along the way, various places along the way, we know that the Hebrews were compiling the written texts of their prophets and their historians, and we know that there are a certain amount of editing that went along. For example, when the book of Samuel, written by whom? Not by Samuel. His own death is reported in 1 Samuel, and it goes on to give a second Samuel. So somebody else was doing that writing for us, not Samuel himself. The Bible itself says, take a scroll and write on it all the words that I have spoken. All right, this was a task that was given to write these things down. Then there we have the phenomenon of the so-called sons of the prophets. These are mentioned several times in the Hebrew Bible. Who were they? Well, these were those who came together in guilds and communities who were devoted to a prophet and to disseminating his message and writing down the things that he said and remembering them generation after generation. And so at least the major prophets seem to have had these, we might call them schools, that continued for some centuries. It is primarily they who preserved for us the Hebrew scriptures. We have mention of men like Jonathan, a man of understanding and a scribe. Well, what do scribes do? They scribble. I mean, that's the old English term for writing, by the way. They copied the scriptures. And then there was Ezra, who had set his heart to study the law of the Lord. And there's a book uh, about Ezra, carries his name. And many scholars believe that Ezra was one of the primary compilers of the final form of the Hebrew Bible. So, this leaves us then with the fact that there are different Hebrew versions of the scripture. There is the Judean versions of the Hebrew Bible, which date from before the 12th century. A Samaritan form of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, also in Hebrew, but it differs in several places. Which one is correct? Then there's the Babylonian texts of the, of the Bible, some of which have been preserved to the present time. And then there were the Essenes. These were a small sect in the Judean part of Israel. We'll come back to them. We have the phenomenon of the Hebrew scribes or copyists. These included some kings and priests. It was required of every king of Israel that he make his personal copy of the Mosaic laws. And some did. Those copies then were preserved and copied and recopied. Then there were the scribes who are met 51 times. They are mentioned in the Hebrew Bible. This was an important task of keeping the scriptures. Leather, by the way, wears out and moths eat it. So you have to keep copying. Then there were the sons of the prophets and by the 5th, 6th century of our era, we had the phenomenon, the rise of the synagogues. And the synagogues all keep their copies of the Torah and many of the other First Testament writings as well. To this day. And then there were the Masoretes. These were scholars who sometime in the middle of our era thought it was important to copy the Hebrew Bible word and letter perfectly. And so they develop a system of marginal notes that they put in their copies of the Bible that looks something like this. They counted words, they counted letters, they had different uh, indicators in the margins as to exactly what the text was supposed to say. And they even knew that some of their, that is their copies of the Hebrew Bible had mistakes in it, but they were so accurate that they kept the mistakes 
and put in the margin what it should have said. And every Bible scholar knows these. If you have a really good study Bible, it will even point those out to you. But then the Old Testament, or the First Testament, was also being translated into other languages. For example, Syrian Aramaic from the 7th century and on. Sometimes called Syriac. It looks like this. And then Judean Aramaic, these are kind of like dialects, was written eventually in what looked like block letters, <clears throat> later adopted by Hebrew. And then the common Greek from the 3rd century BCE and, to, and onwards, the Old Testament was primarily read even by Jewish people in Greek, classical Latin, from about the 5th century uh, CE on. Most Europeans read the Bible in Latin. Uh, one reason for which our theological language to this day is full of long Latin-based words. The oldest existent copy. There are inscriptions in ancient Hebrew that have been discovered. New ones are being found almost every month these days. Very few of them contain First Testament text, but they do mention persons and places and events found in the Hebrew Bible. Then we have the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are full of Bible texts. These were being compiled from actually from the middle of the third century BC on up until 70 AD, thereabouts. So for example, no fewer than 22 copies of the book of Isaiah have been found amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls. Two of them almost complete, the others disintegrated. Greek codices or books from the fourth century they were actually translated in the 3rd century BCE, but our oldest copies are now from the 4th century. And then what we call the Aramaic Targums, translations and commentaries in uh, Aramaic, as the Jews spoke in the medieval period. And then those Masoretic scrolls from the 10th century CE. Maybe you saw in the news about four weeks ago that the Sassoon, copy of the Hebrew Bible was recently sold for some millions of dollars. Well, what was that? That was actually the oldest existing complete Hebrew Bible. But we do have well, today what are called critical editions, which give us the Hebrew text of the oldest form that we have, plus all of the Masoretic notes from antiquity, and every known variant, every known difference between the manuscripts found in all of literature. So, coming back then to our timeline, let's now focus a little bit on the New Testament. By the way, what community created the New Testament? Was that a bunch of Gentiles or anti-Jewish Christians up in Europe someplace? No, who were they? They were first century Jews. Christianity is simply Judaism that recognizes that Messiah has come. Of course, when the Gentiles became more numerous, they brought their own cultural biases and prejudices into Christianity, Latinized it, invented the sermon, and imposed taxes. Okay, so we'll look at uh, Jesus and the apostles here for a moment, and our translations again. So, the New Testament, comprised of the Gospels, or the Evangels, the Book of Acts, the history of the spread of Messianic Judaism, Christianity, and the book of Revelation, otherwise known as the Apocalypse. This growth took place in fewer than a hundred years, probably more like 40. The language of an entire New Testament was that of the common Greek of the, the Greco-Roman Empire, which is, of course, what most people could read and write and discuss in, and across the entire Middle East, by the way. The deity of the New Testament is the God of the Hebrew Bible. And its main message is that the, that awaited Messiah, king figure, he has now come, he taught us, he proved who he was, he died, he rose back to life, and then up into the sky, and is to return to rule over the earth. So this is a continuation of the First Testament message, now partly fulfilled. The three streams then for the New Testament comprise historic persons. You know who some of them are then Jewish literature, 
outside of the Bible and the Greek Bible itself, first translated before Christ came. So let's look at these briefly. Who were the main historic personages? Jesus was one. <laughs> Nearly every historian in the world today alive acknowledges, yes, Jesus lived. Yes, he lived when the Bible says he did. Yes, he lived where they said. We just don't believe who he was. We're told first, though, that John appeared baptizing in the wilderness. We're not even told his other name. His name was not Baptist, by the way, <laughs> though he was, but he was baptizing. In fact, John had such an impact on Israel that he was remembered to this day by some communities who follow John the Baptist and never became Christians. They still exist in the Middle East, kind of dwindling in numbers, but they're there. Then later, this is Jesus, my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased, said a voice from out of the heavens the day that Jesus came and asked John to baptize him. If you haven't been baptized yet, it's a great experience. I recommend it. Then Jesus himself promised that the Spirit of God, called the Holy Spirit, will guide you, you apostles, into all the truth. We believe that he did. And then the apostles themselves turned around and reminded their readers, the eyewitnesses, hundreds of them, to the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, many of them were still alive when the New Testament was written. And had the New Testament been false or fake, those eyewitnesses would have called them on it. Te Second Temple period literature from about the 5th century BCE, the Hebrew communities were very literate, very well read, and they wrote many other books besides those of the Hebrew Bible. Many of them are still in print and you can read them. Michael uh, Schumeyer over here, he's recently read through the book of Enoch, which is possibly about a third or fourth century BC Jewish book. And they're important because they're quoted in the New Testament. There are portions of Jewish books, not from the Bible, that are included in your New Testament, including the book of Enoch. Uh, then we have the, the Apocrypha, are part of the Greek Bible and used to be included in Protestant versions of the Bible. But somewhere along the way, we decided to remove those and be, to stay with the Hebrew and the, and the New Testament Greek. Uh, Catholic Bibles still have the Apocrypha. Not even Catholics believe they're inspired, by the way. They're just very informative because, again, the New Testament quotes from the Apocrypha and uses its language. Then there were Greek poets and philosophers who are also quoted in the New Testament. For we are indeed his offspring, is one of the famous quotations from the, the poets. And then there were the Jewish sects, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Hellenists, the Essenes, and possibly others. And the questions that they raised are often those that Jesus answered in his discourses and teaching. So if you read that literature, you discover sometimes why Jesus said what he did. Then the Greek Bible, meaning so sometimes called the Septuagint, but other translations from the early centuries that were also made and copies of which exist to this day. Most of the quotations found in the New Testament of the Old Testament are actually from the Greek Septuagint version, which differs in some interesting ways from the Dead Sea Scrolls and from the Hebrew. Then there are many allusions in the New Testament, such as the phrase, neglect not to meet together. The word together is not in the Greek. That term meet actually is from this apocrypha. It's used by Paul to talk about our being gathered unto the Lord Jesus. And so in the book of Hebrews, it's using that same language from the apocrypha to say, do not neglect the doctrine of the second coming, but keep on meeting and encouraging each other as you see the day approaching. It seems to be approaching fast right now. And then many of the proof texts, of course, where it says, since it is written, and the vocabulary and the style of the Greek New Testament is adopted from the Septuagint. That's why it sounds like God talking. The textual history of the New Testament then, first again, a lot of this was at first held by memory in the Christian community. For example, Peter reminds us that we were with him. We heard what that voice from heaven said. And finally, eventually, he got around to writing it down. Or others wrote it down for him. 
the epistles, the letters sent by some of the apostles to various Christian synagogues called, called churches these days, likewise written in Greek. And then we have the testimonies. The testimonies possibly of hundreds of eyewitnesses compiled in books called after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, okay? It's an interesting study. Who actually wrote those? Anyway, in the first, second Timothy, we have a mention when Paul says, Luke is with me, bring Mark and the parchment. What for? Why would the apostle Paul, Luke, who was well-traveled, a collector of eyewitness accounts, and Mark, who possibly wrote the first gospel, why would they get together with parchment? Scrolls of leather. Probably to write the gospel of Luke. And so we have these many books, the gospels, the acts, the revelations, but what about the copies? All those old documents from the New Testament, many imagine that there were the autographs, the originals, somebody copied those. And later on, somebody copied that. Later on, somebody copied that. And at every level, mistakes were made. So when you get a thousand copies down the road to today, how many mistakes would there be? And can we actually believe the New Testament? Hasn't it been altered by mistake or on purpose so many times that you cannot trust it? Well, the fact is, the originals were copied hundreds of times, thousands probably, and those copies were taken to every city of the Roman Empire and beyond. And there they were recopied hundreds of times, with the result that even to this day, there are more than 5,000 copies or pieces of the copies of the New Testament that can be found in libraries and monasteries and universities and libraries to this day. And then the translations that were being made of the New Testament into Aramaic and Latin and Coptic, that is the Egyptian languages, and those also were preserved to this day. And so we can actually see what, what the Greeks said by looking at the translations that were made hundreds of years ago. Were there errors made in copies? Well, of course, every time you copy something, you make a mistake, but you go back and you fix it. What did they do? Well, sometimes they omitted a word, usually by mistake. Other times they inserted words that they remembered from another verse. Sometimes they replaced words that they thought were clearer. Just as we have different English translations today and even two or three Ukrainian translations because there's a better way to say it. And sometimes they updated words. Other times they abbreviated all of the sacred names of our existing Greek manuscripts to this day. Words like God, Jesus, Christ, Spirit, even Holy, they don't spell them. They're abbreviated. And then they tried to correct errors when they found them. And other times they miscorrected non-errors that they thought were errors. There are scientists who are devoted to figuring this all out. Here's a, a fragment of the Gospel of John that was probably copied in the second century, just a generation away from the original. And it still exists. Many of these consist of papyrus that is written on reeds. We've got about three minutes to go. Whole books exist from the third century. <clears throat> these were, which were canonized, that is recognized as inspired of God by the for third century, many of them bound together by the fourth century. Here's where Constantine steps in. Constantine the emperor, who had converted to Christianity, went to the churches in council and said, look guys, please settle once for all, which books do you all accept as inspired of God? And he left it to them to figure out. And when they figured it out, he said, all right, I will finance making 50 copies of the entire Greek Bible, Old and New Testaments alike. Fortunately, about three of those, or at least copies of them, exist to this day. And of course, now we have printed editions from the 16th century, uh, of, and what we call critical editions that have figured out, word by word by word, what the, the original probably said. And now, it's going on as we speak, computer generation of all of the available evidence to come out with what we hope will be the most accurate reconstruction to date. So our conclusion then is that the First Testament grew for a thousand years, copies date from 100 BCE. The New Testament was written in the first century, 
as eyewitness accounts. And it has been copied, recopied, and translated thousands of times in different places. The original wording then of the Bible is probably accurate as we have it to about 97%. That said, the original message is 100% certain. You can be confident when you read your Olden Testament and your New Testament, you have the message. Here are some of my sources that I've studied, read through, recommend. I won't mention them by name. You can download these slides that you saw today and a document of the contents from this site.